So we're at the Christmas time, the Christmas season, and uh, just real quick before I, I get too started, I encourage you guys to come Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas Eve service. Uh, pa Pastor Bonnie and, and, uh, and everybody, all of us have got a lot of fun things planned. It's a good thing to invite your friends to. At the end of it, we have this candle lighting ceremony, and we light this place up with candles. It's okay. Fire Marshal says it's okay. And, um, no, and uh, it's going to be a good time. You want to be a part of that. But it's, it's Christmas season and now, so I imagine a lot of you guys, how many of you just show of hands, how many of you are having your family all come to your house? Anybody having that? A lot of people having that? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. How many is just showing up at someone's home? Just raise your hand. You guys all stink. Okay, no. <laughs> um, so for a little while, Michelle and I don't have to host uh, holiday dinners anymore, Christmas dinners, Thanksgiving dinners anymore, because we live 17 and a half hours from any biological family. Okay, so usually we either hitchhike onto someone else's or we do our own, and we don't have a lot of people. But when we were in Joplin, Missouri, there were times, I think there was like several years in a row, where we had everybody over for Thanksgiving. I would borrow my, borrow my dad's Traeger smoker, uh, which is a pellet smoker, where you just turn it on and leave it alone. And it would, turkey would come out beautiful. And there was one year that we did this on Thanksgiving, and we had all our family gather around our huge high top table. If you've been to my house, you may wonder why we don't have a high top table anymore. It's because I broke it. But anyway, and um, we're all gathered around this high top table. And at that time, my older brother, was they were expecting their third child. My younger sister was getting married. Uh, that coming next year, she had just got engaged, and um, my little brother had just bought a home. Um, and so my dad was going around talking about all these changes that was happening in life. He's like, Kyle, you've got a baby you're expecting, and Lindsay, you're getting married, that's wonderful, and Chris, you bought your first new home. And, and then he turned to Michelle and I, and he goes, and Jaden, Michelle... You guys are doing great. You know, you know, there, was, there was nothing different happening in our life. Everything was staying the same. It, it was real clear we were. The church was going well. We were headed in a direction. Everything was happening as we thought we should, but there was no change that was happening. Michelle kind of, and I just kind of turned and like, well, I guess we're boring this year, you know. But we didn't know that uh, that was our last uh, Thanksgiving meal that we would host because we'd be moving here. We had no idea, and I remember when we, when we got, decided to accept this church, we looked at ourselves, well, I guess there's something happening now. There's times in life when we're headed a certain way, and then something happens, and it changes everything. Before Christ, you were headed down a path. You had no idea that you were going, and you thought life was a certain way. But then when you encountered Christ, He changed everything. He changed your heading. Uh, recently, we went uh, duck hunting on Friday. Duck missing is what I like to call it. Duck missing. That's what I do. They hunt, I miss. And we get out in the bay, we're on the boat, and last time we went, the waves were real rocky, and I proved my merit of not being able to drive the boat. And so driving the boat fell to just, and we went out there, and the whole time we were doing this, Mark is shouting, you know, forward, reverse, neutral and so forth and so on. It was a lot of fun watching Mark almost fall in the drink a couple times. That was a lot of fun. And we're doing that and every once in a while it's veer left, veer right and we're changing our heading because you think you're going the right way. But what happens on the bay is, is the, the waves will come and change the way your boat is steering. And so what happens in life is we think that we are going the right way. We think we're heading the right way but the small, the slightest little change can change your bearing. And what seemed like a good idea at the time could turn into a really bad destination. But Jesus foresaw that. God foresaw that. And so he came down in baby form to change our heading so that our destination would be where we actually need to be, where we should should to be. So, my question for you is, is where are you headed right now? Now listen, I don't mean when you die, nothing so morbid as that. I'm not asking you, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? I'm not asking you that. You should think about that. But today I'm not asking you about that. What is it? I'm asking, for instance, like, are you might be headed to retirement. Or you might be headed up the corporate ladder. Or some of you might be headed to divorce. Some of you are headed towards a career. Some of you are headed to start starting a family. And some of you are going into ministry maybe, and some of you might be going to college. Where are you headed? 
Now, if you made your plans, would you be okay if someone changed your heading, your destination? What if you discovered something better? What if you discovered something more? Would it be okay? So I remember when I went to college, we guys in our dorm. So when you go to live in a dorm, you kind of become friends with those in the dorm. I was friends with everybody in my hall in my dorm. But we were a lot of shy guys, okay? A lot of us were Christians growing up, and we were a little shy when it came to girls. I have never been that way when I should have been, but I was never very shy, but they were. And so we would try to push each other to ask girls out. And I remember seeing a girl on campus that wasn't my wife, isn't my wife, and thinking, I'm going to ask that girl out. I like her. I like the way she looks. I like the way she talks. I'm going to ask her out. I did. She wasn't for me. I thought it seemed right. I thought with my eyes and my heart that that seemed right. I went out with her and I realized she wasn't for me. But when I met Michelle, I didn't see her coming. I wasn't looking for her. I wasn't planning for her. She just plopped into my life. And sometimes if we would let go of our plans, then God could start on His plans. Amen? Sometimes if we let go of what we think should happen, then God could start doing what He knows should happen in our life. Okay? So, for instance, you may be thinking right now, I need out of this marriage. And so you're headed for divorce. But what if God did give you a new marriage and a new partner, but not in name? What if God changed you, changed your spouse, and changed your marriage? Now, you may be saying, that's not possible, but I think that we serve a God who doing the impossible and making someone new is absolutely His business. You might be in a marriage today and you think you should be headed for divorce because there's no way that you could stand this person any longer. And that's because both of you need to change. And some of you may be thinking you're headed to college and maybe you've always wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> and your mom was a teacher, your grandma was a teacher, and you want to be a teacher. And so you head off to college and you find out that God wants you to be a nurse. In fact, we have someone in church today that that very thing happened. It's Danielle Hosey. She went to, to go out to be a teacher, and then she went on a mission trip. I don't know what made her crazy and think that she should go out. I don't remember where it was, in Honduras or someplace like that, someplace dangerous, I don't know. She got in the plane, and she thought that she was supposed to be a teacher, and the next thing she knew, that God had called her to be a nurse. God changed her heading. I think she likes it. In fact, a lot of times I've been there visiting someone who was about to pass away or is very sick late, late at night at Carroll County Hospital and boom, God has an evangelist right there in the ER. There's ways a man think he should go, but it is the Lord who directs their what? Steps. See, we, we want God to move in our life, but in order for God to move in our life, we have to move out of the way. And maybe you're headed up the ladder in your company, and yet God wants is not for you to ladder climb, but to switch careers. Being high at the company maybe isn't a priority to God, but you helping people is. And doing something that fulfills your calling is important. Would you be okay if God changed your heading? See, we talk about surrendering our all. Are we okay with that? I mean, we're okay with surrendering our all and God changing our destination when it comes to heaven and hell, but when it comes to our everyday life, leave that alone. Where I spend my money, leave that alone. I mean, what for instance, just heaven forbid, God, I mean, Starbucks isn't so much around here, there is so much, but what if God told you to stop buying your caramel mocha frappuccino from Dunkin' Donuts? And instead told you to take that five or six dollars and put it away and buy some kids a coat during this winter. Would you be okay with God changing your every day in that situation? What if God called you to fast your lunch every day and whatever you would spend on that lunch money, you put it away and you send it out in the missions? Would we be okay with God changing that heading? We're okay with surrendering all when it gets us heaven. But are we okay with surrendering all when it changes our day? You see, heaven and hell starts with today. Not just your heaven and hell. And it's not just about scaring people and they're not burning for all of eternity. It's understanding that some people right now are living in hell. I don't mean in eternity. Every day for them is, pardon my French, hell. And 
and God has sent His missionaries into the world to do something, and He's trying to change our heading, but we're so stubborn-headed that we can't turn and change. God is in the business of making things new. Encountering God changes where we are heading in our everyday life. And it's not fun sometimes. Sometimes you want that Starbucks or that Dunkin' Donuts. And maybe your wallet's tight and God's calling you to pay for the car behind you. And you don't want to do it, but you know that you need to do it. There's been times my family and I were getting ready to give to somebody. And we would be like, man, we don't have the money. And we're like, this is definitely the time we need to because it should hurt. Giving should hurt. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, hey, save up enough money so you're comfortable and you have all the toys you could want. Enjoy your luxury couch, heated and cooled. No, God says give to the poor. Giving hurts. Think about a baby. When you give to that baby, it hurts. When you have a baby, you had no idea what pain was until you had a baby. I'm not just talking about the physical. I mean, that love for that kid hurts. If anybody was ever to hurt that kid, you would take them out. But that kind of love hurts. And that's the kind of love that God calls us to every single day. All right, where are you headed in your life? Our encounter changes where we are heading in our everyday. It changes the possible. We talked about that. It changes the path that we're on. It changes the outlook. Outlook. Outlaw. It changes our heading. So today we're going to talk about the wise men. And the wise men's life was spent in the pursuit of wisdom. Wisdom is where they were heading. A star appeared in the sky and changed their lives and where they were headed. Before Christ, how we lived our lives and where our lives are headed was much different. But then there was the encounter, and the encounter changes everything. Turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're going to need verses 1 through 12, I think. Yeah, I think I only have verses 1 through 2 there up there. Mark chapter 2, we're going to need verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So they saw and they came. They saw a movement of God and they became a part of the movement of God. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests, teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, O Bethlehem, in land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly. And found out from them exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and worship and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented them with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Heavenly Father, say what you want to say. This is your service. This is your sermon. This is your way. I pray only that we would be open vessels to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said... Amen. So here's the truth about the scripture. The wise men moved in the direction that God was moving. The wise men moved in the direction that God was moving. So when I was in Tennessee, I was a youth pastor for about two and a half years. We had 30 to 40 teens in our youth group. 
I moved down there from Kansas. I'd never really, I lived in Kansas and Louisiana, and that was it. And we moved down to Tennessee. Anybody ever lived in Tennessee? Anybody ever been to Tennessee? Anybody ever been there? Yeah, okay. It's a whole other place. If you never lived in the South, it's much, much different, okay? The, it's not that we're not friendly here, but there's this thing called Southern hospitality. I would go to a restaurant. If somebody from the church saw me at the restaurant, my meal was paid for. Every Sunday, someone had me over to church to the point where I grew and grew and grew. <laughs> and it was going well. And I got this buddy, his name was Titus. Now Titus was about uh, 400 pounds. Um, he was a really nice guy. He was really funny. And he wasn't always funny on purpose. Um, like one time he spilled syrup on the carpet and he thought it would be a good idea if he vacuumed it up. That was Titus. But I have one of the things in ministry, I don't, I'm not trying to brag here, but one of the things I have as a minister is I can spot the gift of pastoring in another person. I've, I've had a hand in every church that I've been in except Joplin in naming my successor. Having been a part of mentoring that person and bringing him in. And I was in, in Tennessee. I could see Titus, my buddy. I could see that, that he had a call in the ministry. And so I began to express this with him. And I said, why are you not in it? And he's like, I don't know. And he was frightened and he was scared about it. And so I realized that Titus needed to be in ministry, and I quickly realized watching him with our teens that he was more talented than I. He was a better speaker than I was. He could play guitar. He was a better singer. He was, there was a lot of talent that was there that he had that I didn't possess. In fact, my time in Tennessee was a turmoil one. It was hard. I had times where things were going well and things where things were not going well. But at this point in time, things were going well. And God spoke to me that Titus needs to be in ministry. And not only does he need to be in ministry, he needs to have your job. You need to leave. That's a tough place to find yourself in. To realize that, that you weren't the guy for the job. And I'm going to tell you, for those two and a half years, I fought for every team that was in that youth group. We were smaller. And when I got there, when I left, we were bigger. Things were going in the direction we needed to go. I saw these teens from, uh, from some of them were in junior high and they were in high school now. I had them over. When a teen would not come to youth group, I'd call their mom and dad and ask them if I could have it over on the Wednesday. I would take them out into, we had a creek and there was a waterfall and I would take them in the creek. We'd walk in a creek and I would talk to them about God and they'd start coming again. I had really fought for every one of those teens. Every time a teen was upset at me, I met with them. I, with them. I had bled for these teens. And God told me, they are not yours. I'm like, God, look, I've done what I'm supposed to do. Every time when someone's gone astray, I've gotten every one of them back. I've been a part of this church. I've bled for this church. And I'm heading towards this church. God, let me reap the benefits. And God said, you have to go. So, I put a call in. I got a call from a church in Oklahoma. Accepted the call. Turned to my buddy Titus and said, I'm leaving. Not only am I leaving, you're going to take my job. I walked into the senior pastor's office, knocked on the door. He's a district superintendent in Ohio right now. And I said, you know, Wendell, yeah, come in. I said, sit down. I was like, I'm leaving. You are? Yeah, I'm leaving. I've got a job in Oklahoma. But I know who's going to take my job. Who? Titus. No way. He vacuums the carpet up when there's syrup there. No way. No way. I'm like, no, this is the guy. No, no, this is, I'm telling you, this is the guy. I would leave and I'm calling, I'm harassing him. Titus is the guy. Now, when I left that youth group, we were running like 30 or 40 teens. Titus did get the job and they shot up right away, 60 or so teens. And he was there for seven or eight years and now he's a senior pastor in Ohio. He's had brain cancer that was stage four, like two years ago. He's still preaching. Still alive. None of those things would have happened if I wanted my way. I'd say, no, I, I need this job. I'm more important than your call. No, see, God came to me and he changed my heading and I had to step out of the way. Listen, I'm not holding myself up as a martyr. The truth of the matter is it was very hard for me to admit that I was not as gifted as this man for this job. It's, it, it, it's hurt my ego for years. But sometimes, guys, we need to understand that the plans that we make aren't good. The design that you have aren't good. Teenagers, some of the people that you want to date are not good for you. They're attractive, but they are not good. Guys, maybe that job does pay more money, but the headache is not worth it. 
And maybe you think if you get divorced that the grass is greener on the other side. But I'm telling you, as I used to tell the cows that would lean across our fence, it tastes the same. Where you're headed is not good. The wise men moved in the direction that God was moving. And it wasn't comfortable. They had to pack up and they had to head out. When they saw the star, we believe it's two years later they got to Jesus' door. Now in the manger scene, actually, are they up here? Yeah, it's right here. So this is inaccurate. First of all, they weren't white. <laughs> and they weren't that small. <laughs> you didn't paint them. No, this is beautiful, by the way. This is absolutely beautiful. But there's wise men here. Traditionally, in the nativity scene, there's wise men here. But we know they weren't there. They packed up, they headed out, and it took them a long time to get there. And when they got there, it would, God had to direct them by star. You talk about faith to move out there. They thought where they are headed to wisdom was going to be great. But God let them see their Savior. What if you guys stopped your plans and followed God's and you could see the salvation that the Lord could bring? What if you stopped your plans and you followed God and you could see the help that God could bring? What if you stopped trying to fix your marriage and you started laying your marriage at God's feet? What if you stopped trying to, to fix your situation and you laid your situation down at Jesus' feet and said, I can't do it? Then you'll find that God can. Amen? That God can. It is believed that these wise men were descendants of wise men taught by Daniel himself when he was in exile. That's how we believe we knew that the Messiah was coming. Regardless, they stopped what they were doing, where they were headed, and they headed into God's story being written through them. They saw the star, they came. They saw the star, they saw the star. They thought the tar, they saw the star, and they changed. We know that they weren't at Jesus' birth, but they were at Jesus' feet. They moved in the direction that God was moving. So what is your reaction when you see the movement of God? Do you critique it because it's not been that way? Do you complain because it wasn't in your plan? Do you ignore it because it demands too much? Or do you join it? Because there's nowhere else you'd rather be than the movement of God. I'm going to tell you, I can play a, a board game, maybe two, and then I'm done. Anybody else like that, you know? Anybody ever finish a game of Monopoly? Oh, you lose family members over that game. And, you know, last night, the kids were gathering around, and we let them all pick one. We play one board game, I'm like, oh, no. We play two board games, I'm like, oh, no. Michelle picks a board game. I'm like, oh, no. They're like, Daddy, it's you get to pick. I pick that we don't play. <laughs> we watched some movie. I don't remember what it was. Instead, Christmas Carol. Yeah, with uh, Star Trek. I don't know what Picard was doing in that show, but whatever. Um, but I sat there, and I'm going to tell you, I enjoy being by my family, but after a board game or two, you know, I'm done. But I sat there. And I did that, not because I'm a martyr, I did that because it doesn't matter what's happening, I want to be where my family is. You know what I'm saying? And some, if all my family, I would hate this, if all my family the day after Christmas, because my wife wants to go to Hobby Lobby, because apparently that's what you do the day after Christmas. <laughs> Hobby Lobby is like, the worst, only thing worse than Hobby Lobby is Chuck E. Cheese. You ever got their pizza? Just go, go get some cardboard and eat it. Put some cheese on it. That's what it tastes like. But if all my family said, we want to all go to Hobby Lobby, Daddy, come. You better believe I'm coming because I'm going where my family is moving, right? And sometimes as a church, we're going to be headed down a path. And guess what? It might make you uncomfortable. You might not like it, but wouldn't you rather be a part of the movement of God? Some of you older folks, maybe. I'll leave it to you what means older. Okay, some of you older folks, maybe, maybe this music that we do isn't quite your music. But by the way, Kim, you guys did a fantastic job. But isn't that where God's moving? Look around the church and see how many people are here. When we changed the sanctuary and we, God did some amazing things, it doesn't look like it used to, but that's part of God's movement. And that's just a microcosm of how God moves. That's just in a church. In your life, God's going to move in ways that he hasn't before. And it's going to make you uncomfortable. 
Because each time God gives you something and you do it, He's going to give you more. So if God asks you to help one neighbor, the next time He's going to ask you to help two. But each part of the time that you do it, you will be blessed internally. And there are times that God calls you to bear things. That people will be mean to you and they will hurt you because of the sake of the cross. But God calls you to bear it. Man, when Peter and John were called in front of the Sanhedrin, they're like, stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And they're like, we obey God instead of you. And they're like, oh, we're going to beat you. And they literally beat them almost to the point of death. And they got done and Peter and John are jumping up and down, praising God that they're worthy for suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. And you and I, when somebody confronts us and we get uncomfortable, we start crying. <laughs> he called me blah, blah, blah. My boss was mean to me. Guys, come on. We are called to suffer at times. See, the wise men were headed in the direction and God changed it and they hid in the way that God was moving. Are you willing to move with God even when it doesn't make sense for you? Are you willing to move for God even when it costs you something? That's what Christmas is all about. God couldn't stand to be away from His family. We wouldn't come to Him, so He came to us. And maybe you have a family member who won't come to you. They won't return your calls. They won't let you come over. You just keep knocking on that door. Door. There was a person in church who did that to me one time. Guess what I did? I left notes. I came by every day. I banged on the door. And guess what day? They opened it and let me in because I was just that annoying. <laughs> they wouldn't return my calls. And I got in that door. And I embraced them. And I said, I love you. And I did their funeral recently. And they died with me being their pastor, because I wasn't going to let them go. Moms and dads, guess what? I don't care what your kid did, you never stop being a parent. And kids, guess what? I don't care what your mom or dad did, you never stop being their child, even if they say so. God loved those people that nailed Him hand and foot, dislocated his arms and legs so they could be stretched out and hung them on a tree. And as they were doing it, he prayed for their salvation. And you and I can't love somebody that makes us uncomfortable? Guys, we move in the direction that God is moving and God is always moving in the direction of love. Amen? That's what Christmas is all about. The movement of God moves in the everyday for you where you are. So, here's a question. Where does your current currently take you? So, have you ever been to a lazy river? You know what those are? Okay. You go to the water park. Okay, if you didn't know what a water park is, that's where everybody in public goes to pee. <laughs> Just kidding. Was that rude or crude of me? I don't care. So you go there, and they have this thing called a lazy river. And what usually happens is, is you get on this, like, in, which it's basically designed to make you look as bad as possible. Okay, so you get on your swimsuit, which no one looks good in, and you get on this thing, and if you're any weight overweight, you are going to sit on it, and you're going to flop over. Five or six times. It's just part of the ride. You finally get in it. They say, sir, just get inside. The tube won't fit over your stomach. So they just let you kind of put it over like this. I'm not speaking from personal experience, but whatever. And you get in this river, and what happens is once you get in this river, it pushes you a certain way. There's a current. You know what I'm talking about? And the current pushes you around. And then your kids, after you've baked in the sun forever, dealt with this thing, cutting off your circulation, say, Daddy, can we go again? <laughs> you move where the current is taking you. So... Where is your current currently taking you? Where is your current currently having you? So in the Lazy River, it currently has me in a circle that never ends. You know when you get off, you got to do the whole thing over again. You fall, you trip. Some teenage kid tries to help you up. Your shirt comes up, but you're embarrassed. No, it's me. And that's where my current take me. I'm like, why do I ever go to these places? And you may be in your life, and you're, you're going along your life, and you have chose your current. You have chose your heading. You have chose the direction you're going. 
And what happens is, is that your current has taken you to addiction. Your current has taken you to bad marriage. Your current has taken you to financial crisis. Your current has taken you to depression because you're following your flow instead of following God's flow. But if you pop open your Bible, if you get down on your knees and pray, you step into God's current that will take you where you need to go. And some of us, some of us are in toxic currents. Some of us are not where we need to be. But God's current men's broken relationships. But some of us are caught up in a toxic current. You remember in Chicatigue when I almost drowned? I got in the riptide. Okay? And it started taking me out to sea. And as it was taking me out to sea, and I realized I wasn't going to be able to save myself, I prayed. I said, dear Lord, I guess you're going to have to help me. I didn't know, because the waves were going like this. Starting to make me sick. (laughs) I'm floating on these boogie boards, you know. I'm like, man, I'm going to make a nice snack for a shark. Make a good meal. (laughs) Tastes like pork. (laughs) The whole time, I was in that current. There was a 5'5", 120-pound lifeguard watching this big idiot. In fact, she had to- I almost got caught in it one time before, and she told me, she blew her whistle on me. Isn't that embarrassing when the lifeguard blows her whistle? Everybody stops what they're doing. And she's like, you idiot, you know. So she was watching me that whole time, and I'm in that current thinking nobody sees me. My brother is gone down the way, and he can't see me. I am keep going out further and further to see him. Like, this is not good and looking good. But the whole time, that lifeguard saw me in that current. And so after I prayed, immediately when I got done, up a wave, I saw this little 5'5", 5 foot, 5 foot 5, 120 pound lifeguard come out and get me. And she had this moment. And I was embarrassed. And she said, do you need any help? And in my head, I said, no. Because <laughs> not some 5 foot 5 lifeguard is going to rescue me. But God said, you prayed. I said, but couldn't you send like Arnold Schwarzenegger, (laughs) Sylvester Stallone, you know, somebody, Bruce Lee, bring him back from the dead? But no, you (laughs) you sent some Britney Spears out to get me. And I said, yeah. He said, get on my board. And I said, do I have to? He said, yeah, the whole beach is gathered around. And she got me out of the riptide. She got me out of the wrong current. She got me out of what was going to kill me. And she got me to where I could be safe. Do you understand? But I had to surrender to that. In fact, my wife's like, why didn't you help her at all? You were just like laying there. (laughs) That's what she said when I walked out of the water. Just so you know, like an hour later, someone was rescued and the wife like cried and rubbed her arm around. My wife was like, what's wrong with you? Don't you, like, lift weights? <laughs> Loser. No. I'm totally exaggerating a lot, okay? She said it a lot kinder than that, like, way later. But anyway, it's funnier than And so, <laughs> yeah. But she got me where I needed to be. And I was, I mean, she made me just lay there, guys. I had to lay there. She put her head in my butt. <laughs> she didn't even buy me dinner. And so, I was like, do we exchange numbers? I don't know. And, uh. So I was going in, and she's laying there, and she would not let me get out of the board until my feet touched the ground. And then I was safe. And some of you guys are caught in a toxic current that you've chosen. And if you keep kicking, and you keep splashing, and you keep doing, if you keep trying to fix your marriage and dig yourself out of that hole until you surrender, you're never going to get out of that current. Where is your current currently have you? So, here's the steps. Check your symptoms to check your current. So, when I was in that ocean, the symptoms was I was being dragged out to sea. So, we went hunting, okay? Duck hunting, duck missing. Mark and them, I think, were starting to feel sorry for me. I I expected to miss. And a duck started heading straight toward me. I thought, I can't miss this thing. There it is. And Mark's like, Jade, this is your moment. The heavens open up. Oh! kill this creature that lives you know I bring my gut up that's not my own because my gun's not big enough I bring my gun up that's not my own shoot boom it veers 
and I miss. I miss. So the symptoms of me not being able to hit a duck is me missing, right? I'm not a good shot. I'm okay with that. All right. I'm just happy that Mark lets me hold the gun. I wear camouflage and take pictures like, look, I did something. <laughs> symptoms of you being in the wrong current is depression. Now listen. If you're depressed today and you're a Christian, don't think that you're doing something wrong. You, you need help and that's okay. You could be depressed as a Christian, but you can't stay in depression. You've got to do something about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? If your marriage is in trouble, guess what? There's a lot of good Christian people that need marriage counseling. Guess what? That's okay. What's not okay is just to put your head in the sand and ignore it or try to do something your own and not surrender it to God. That is being in the wrong current. If you find yourself addicted to food, sugar, soda cocaine, alcohol, pornography, gambling. Am I getting closer? That is a symptom of you being in the wrong current. It's not that gambling's bad, pornography's bad, eating too much is bad, but they are symptoms of a bigger problem, you being in the wrong current. You can't take care of your addiction until you get into the right current. Listen, I can be ridiculously looking until I get out of that lazy river. I cannot look cool in the lazy river. Okay, it's just not going to happen. It, it's not going to happen. And once I step out of that, I feel kind of safer. You understand what I'm saying? So you notice currently we're doing some work around the church, right? And Chris apparently likes to work on a high wire. And he put this thing out here that, that is a stretch. It's like this little walkway about this path, okay? And I thought when Chris was gone, because I'm scared of heights, could I overcome my fear right now? Could I be brave? Chris wouldn't know. And so I took a step. Nope. <laughs> and I felt safe when I took three steps backwards, you know. And some of you guys, you are in a spot that you, you're going to fall. I know that I would have passed out if I went much further. I just know that myself. I've almost done it. I would, I would pass out. I know. It's ridiculous. I know I'm a baby, but that's the case. But I know myself. And maybe you are a person that struggles with anger. Or maybe you have an addicted personality. Or maybe you are prone to depression. And you're not doing anything about it. You're just getting yourself into places that are going to get yourself hurt. And maybe your marriage, you do need a third person that can help you work through that. Maybe, maybe there's been times you've cheated on one another or times you've been lied to one another. Whatever it is, you're headed towards divorce. But I'm here to tell you, God can heal you. And maybe you've been angry for a really long time and you tried to get rid of the anger on your own. Or maybe you've lived your life on your own. You've never had Christ in your life. I'm here to tell you, get in the right current. If you find yourself in the wrong place, it's because you're headed the witch the wrong way. And the only way to get in the right way is to surrender the map to God and let Him move. I'm going to tell you, when I did get out of that ocean, dripping wet, I was embarrassed. I was also relieved. Because once I got on that stupid, <laughs> stupid board, I knew I was safe. I don't know why a five foot five, 120 pound person can swim and I can't, but whatever, man, I don't care. I got on the shore. And maybe your marriage will get fixed with some humiliating things that you've got to do. Maybe your relationship with your kid will get fixed, but you're going to have to eat some crow. Maybe your finances are going to be fixed, but guess what? You're going to have to stop buying things impulsively. Or you're going to have to get a second job or a third job. And maybe you're in the wrong relationship, you're dating the wrong person, and it's going to get uncomfortable, but you need to break up with them. Maybe you're in a job that is sucking your soul, and it's going to be tight for a while, but you've got to get out of that job. The wise men, they saw the star, and they came. Get in God's current. Get where God is moving you. And I'm telling you, you can't see how, but He's going to make it okay.